Ominous rocks, killer robots, people in mortal danger. Seriously, aren't you tired of this? Fatigue is a distraction from our purpose. As our complaints. Oh, I haven't begun to complain yet. Ouch! Ugh! Now I'm complaining. Focus, Sagira. Reach for the sky, big guy. Need help? Again? I've got it, thank you. Well? Osiris? What, what did you see? Slow down! Wait... I thought I... Oh, sh... Go! To your left! Two o'clock! Medium range! You're welcome! You know, I can't help but notice that even with all of reality to explore, you keep picking the places where they shoot at us. We can't stay here. If the Vex succeed, it's the end of everything. Sagira, we can see your light. You have to go. Nope, not leaving you. Without me, there's no coming back. If I don't stop the Vex, there won't be anything to come back to. I'm doing this for the both of us. Don't you even... Huh? Oh, Sire! What's going on ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guardians of all ages, Joker back again once again. The introduction to Osiris and his ghost Sagira is one of the most charming and endearing moments in the history of Destiny storytelling. In this small cinematic, these two characters show more character than the vast majority of paper-thin vending machines were told our characters throughout the Destiny franchise. It's small things, like this badass mythologized warlock Osiris getting frustrated with his device and Sagira teasing him over it. Need help? Again? I've got it, thank you. Or, Sagira going around and playing pranks on the Vex. Reach for the sky, big guy. It's a shame then that this vignette is not indicative of things to come. But don't take my word for it. Here's IGN's Destin Laguerre who played it. Overall, Osiris left me feeling like the campaign was hollow. And you can kind of see the seams of this, of somebody on the writing team not quite understanding why we like certain characters, or what character even is. In the first mission, we're reintroduced to Brother Vance. Only, instead of the stoic mystic who speaks in riddles, Does Osiris live? I assure you, he lives through me. I may be blind, Guardian. But I know you're there. Ask yourself, what would you do if the speaker was proven a charlatan? Who headed one of the most prestigious events in Destiny 1's PvP, the Trials of Osiris, Brother Vance is reduced to a caricature of a fanboy. It's almost as if Bungie has replaced Brother Vance with my long-running gag character, Joker A Fanboy. I call a ray! Osiris's greatest student. Brother Vance, Osiris's greatest fan. Praise be to our Lord and Savior Luke Smith. Praise be to Bungie. It's like Bungie has forgotten how to write a serious or mature story. Cade Six is a popular character for being the only actual character in Destiny for the longest time. And I think Bungie has misunderstood the fans' enjoyment of the character, to the point of turning every character in the game into a joke character. It's not that the fanbase wants something to laugh at all the time. That gets boring and monotonous. 
It's that Nathan Fillion is a good actor, and he helped Cade 6 stand out. Bungie's writing team seems to have taken that to mean that all fans want are moments of levity. Yet, if you look at the most talked about aspects of lore, it's the darker stuff that people latch onto. It's Thorn and Dredgen Yor. It's the last word in Shin Malfur. It's Kabir the Legionless and his raid team in the Vault of Glass. It's the Books of Sorrow. It's Six Fronts. It's Twilight Gap. It's the Reef Wars. It's a lot of dark and heavy stuff that occasionally has moments of levity. The Curse of Osiris DLC presents us with a dark scenario. We are still at war with the Cabal, kind of. The Emperor of the Cabal is still in our system doing who knows what. And now, the Vex have started to summon an army from all corners of time and space to conquer reality. On top of that, Osiris is missing or dead. So how does this DLC choose to open up? Does it keep with the tone and the seriousness of the quest we've embarked on? No. In a jarring tonal whiplash, it takes a character who was intriguing and turns him into an utter joke. I call her Ray, Osiris's greatest student. Brother Vance, Osiris's greatest fan. Whomever is writing characters over at Bungie has absolutely no clue how to write them. They only know how to write one-note jokes. The only highlight is that some tend to be presented better than others. In the IGN video, they report that it only took them a couple of hours to beat the Curse of Osiris' campaign. After playing the first mission, which took us to the new destination, I had the opportunity to rush through the 2-3 hour campaign where core components like shooting and leveling felt as good as they always do. Once I completed it, however, I was left thinking simply, that's it? According to PC Gamer, in terms of campaign length, I saw eight missions, two of which are substantial enough that they'll be added to the strike pool. You can reasonably expect to play through in a solid session. Destiny 2 The Curse of Osiris has an eight mission campaign. Six, if we exclude the two new strikes. That doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Destiny 2 had a lot of pacing issues. Oh boy, did it have pacing issues seeming to come from a much, much larger story, which, given how the raid plays out, more on that later, implies that perhaps the story of Destiny 2's Red War was a little more overarching before the reboot. From a story and lore sense. Six to eight missions to explore the Vex's Grand Master plan that they have been laying in wait since literally time immemorial to spring seems cheap. It really does feel like a ripoff. Three years of trying to figure out what the Vex are up to, and the first time we see them in any level of importance to the story, it's over in a blink of an eye. Three years. Three years of hyping up this Vex master plan, and hyping up Osiris, and this is it? This is what we get? This is the payoff? Are you fucking kidding me? Don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with a short and concise story that gets to the point. That said, for the new players, in this DLC, Bungie is going to have to introduce the Vex again, introduce their master plan, introduce time travel, and how all of that works in the Destiny universe, and introduce all these new characters, on top of telling the story of the Vex's master plan coming to fruition, and us stopping it. To do any of that justice at all would necessitate a lore entry the size of the Book of Sorrows and then some, on top of a Taken King-like expansion. I guess the real question here is, did Bungie give it the good old college try and do what they could to live up to the lore the best they could with the time and resources they had to tell this story? Or, and more likely, is this a Vex-themed side story that tangentially flirts with the ideas of time travel and exploring Osiris, but ultimately shies away feeling hollow and vapid and failing to live up to three years of teasing? that has been done for one character and one master plan, and is nothing more than a soulless cash grab that has the most interesting race in the game on the box, with the most interesting warlock in all of Destiny on the box. I guess we'll find out December 5th, but it shouldn't be too terribly hard to figure out which side I'm leaning towards. Let's see, what else? 270 strikes? I mean, gee, thanks Bungie for bringing back the Heroic Strike playlist from Destiny 1, which 
should have shipped with the game and doing so without modifiers and doing so at 65 light le- or I mean power levels below the max. You know, I know they say don't look a gift horse in the mouth, but when the motherfucker comes limping up with two bad legs, perhaps, maybe, you should give it a look. Now, I'm willing to go ahead and give Bungie the benefit of doubt here, because I love giving people just enough rope to hang themselves with, and say that these strike values and numbers and lack of modifiers exist in a test build which is still being tuned. This could change. I guess we'll see December 5th. But you likely didn't come here to hear me talk about the story, or the lore, or level count, or strikes. You want my thoughts on the raid. So, how is the raid going to function? Once more, for those who might have missed it, how does it work, Bungie? Summarize for me, what is a raid lair? Uh, a raid lair is a brand new six-player raid activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this raid layer, we're going back to the Leviathan. It's an entirely new set of encounters, new puzzles, new loot, completely new places to explore. You gotta remember this ship eats planets. That's how big this thing is. Big place. Yeah. Lots of different places to explore. And then we have a brand new final boss for you to fight. Hmm, this sounds familiar. I think I've heard it before. Where was this predicted, I wonder? Hmm. This literally could mean anything. For example, we get a new cool raid with the Curse of Osiris, and that'll be the best thing to happen to Destiny since Taken King. Or, Leviathan is just getting an update. This can mean anything, by the way, from new areas, which in essence would make it a new raid. You know what? I hate being right. It's always about stupid shit. It's never the winning lotto numbers. So, the last time I heard Bungie describe a raid as a... What is the scope of a raid lair, if you were to try to size it up? So, it's not as lengthy as the original Leviathan, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's still a, a boss and then all the challenges leading up to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's going to be a pretty sizable addition. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's no less challenging or less fun than any other raid we've made. This raid is a ton of fun. We've been playing a lot internally. It's extremely challenging. You're going to die a lot. The last time we heard Bungie talk that way about a raid, we got Crota's End. And thinking about the Leviathan, it's not bigger than Vault of Glass. It's definitely not bigger than King's Fall or Wrath of the Machine. Leviathan is bigger than Crota's End. So, what does smaller than Leviathan mean? Well, I don't think it's a huge leap in logic to assume Crota's End or smaller. So, a glorified strike. Yay! Good news, everybody! Destiny 2 Curse of Osiris gets three strikes. One's on the Leviathan. Yay! And this is before we begin to even try to dissect the Herculean leap in logic that us mere mortals could never possibly hope to comprehend, which has resulted in three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back Cabal raids. When we could have... I don't know, had a Vex raid, or a Rasputin raid, or fuck, I don't know, a real survival mode. Unless the Infinite Forest is a survival mode, that could be cool. At which point, thank you Bungie. I wouldn't mind having a piece of DLC-oriented endgame, and a continuation of the Leviathan shenanigans. Everyone and their grandmother knows that Destiny 2 could use more endgame content. And I doubt a Crota's End size strike will fill that twilight gap. That's like... That's like feeding a starving man half of a cookie and then making him pay 20 bucks for it. Sure, thanks, I guess. Now, like I've said before, I'm a quality over quantity kind of guy. So we'll revisit this dumpster fire of an idea later and see how it pans out. A good raid is a good raid is a good raid and I'll judge the quality of it when I see it. If it's a lot of fun, if it's got loot that's worth getting, then who cares how long it is? That said, what the actual fuck, Bungie? More Cabal? This clearly wasn't a last second choice. This is how this year's raid content was planned out. But man, two raids that will likely have no tie-ins to the story of the DLC that they're introduced in and will likely just be announced via an in-game prompt like the faction rallies or the Iron Banner? Oh man, come on. You're busting my balls, guys. I get that this is going somewhere. To Callus. 
I just don't think Kallus' story is strong enough to stand next to the Vex or Rasputin. The Cabal have never been the most interesting race in Destiny. Yay, more big dumb Roman war rhinos. Ruled by Caligula. That's it. Yes, I understand. There are some tidbits that might lead to some kind of Ahamkara interaction. And some kind of interaction with the darkness. And Kallus, well he's clearly up to something. But at the same time, he's not really been antagonistic. Yes, things in the raid attack us, but it is just for his entertainment, and the trade-off is we're going there for loot, which he invited us to come and take if we participated in his arena. So we know what we're getting into. So far, what we've seen of the Kallus story doesn't warrant three raids. Maybe I'll be proven wrong, I hope I'm proven wrong, but man, let me tell you what, that, that is a rough pill to swallow. Three Cabal raids, like, come on Bungie, come on, nobody wants that. But when you compare the Cabal, when you compare Kallus, to things like the Vex, the Vex have already been established. The Hive have already been really established, as have the Fallen. The Cabal got their own full game, and unfortunately, thanks in large part to the removal of the Grimoire, the Cabal are still not fleshed out. And they're clearly not the big bads. Savathun and or Korriblade Transformed are on their way. And so are whatever those pyramid ships are. Provided those aren't just Savathun and or Korriblade Transformed. Destiny 2, in a lot of ways, feels pointless. Like it's just spinning its wheels, waiting for the right time to suddenly reveal the secrets of the universe in Destiny 3. But we've still got a few years till we can have that, so stall as long as possible and hope to keep the damage to a minimum. But like always ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guardians of all ages, those are just my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below, and like always, stay frosty.